Welcome to MEB. This is episode two about process anatomy and block flow diagrams. You've probably heard and used the word process before in your everyday life, but it means something special for chemical engineers. When we use it, we are referring to a series of steps or operations that transform raw materials into finished product. Take the process to make paper products, for example. Most people probably know that paper comes from wood, but how does a rigid, thick, brown, heavy log become soft, white, thin, flexible paper? Try to imagine the key steps involved in this process. One of the first key steps is to debark the tree and break it down into smaller pieces in a wood chipper. The next key step in the process is to break down and digest lignin, which is the molecule in wood which makes it strong and rigid. This is achieved by cooking the wood chips in an alkaline solution called white liquor, which is a mixture of sodium hydroxide and sodium sulfide. Next, a series of bleaching steps turns the pulp from brown to white, and finally the paper is pressed and rolled into giant rolls like this one. Chemical processes can look complicated and intimidating, even for experienced chemical engineers. There are pipes going all over the place, and vessels sometimes look the same, even though they perform different functions. It's challenging, if not impossible, to know exactly what's going on in a chemical process just by looking at it. To help conceptualize processes, chemical engineers frequently represent them with diagrams. The simplest type of such a diagram, and the one that we'll draw and use the most often in MEB, is called the block flow diagram or BFD for short. In a BFD, boxes represent process units and arrows represent material flows. When we apply the concept to the paper making process, hopefully you can see how much easier and clearer it makes it to visualize. In this block flow diagram, I've added process units for power generation and solvent recovery. Next, let's talk about some of the typical process units that we will see frequently in MEB. Reactor. Reactors are arguably the most important part of any chemical process because, as the name implies, reactions occur there. Many products made by chemical engineers are not naturally occurring, so they must be generated via chemical reactions. We will only consider generic reactors in MEB, but your future course in kinetics and reactor design will cover the different types of reactors, including continuously stirred tank reactors, or CSTRs, and plug flow reactors, or PFRs. Separator. Much to our dismay as chemical engineers, reactions are not perfect or ideal. Conversions are rarely 100% and side reactions are likely in real life. As a result, the product stream from a chemical reactor is unlikely to be pure. Since we can generally sell pure products for a higher price, we might want to purify our products with a separator. Again, we will only discuss generic separators, but your future course in separations will talk about specific types of separators, including distillation columns, liquid-liquid extractors, absorbers, scrubbers, and many more. Mixers. A mixer is kind of the opposite of a separator and used when you want to blend two or more streams into a single stream. This unit is often used directly upstream or before chemical reactors to make sure that reactant molecules are well mixed prior to entering the reactor. Heat exchanger. Temperature, as we'll discuss in a later episode, is one of the key process variables. The temperature of a stream may need to be increased or decreased for any number of reasons, including better reaction yields, more efficient separations, or safety. A heat exchanger is the process unit that allows two streams to come into contact with one another, but not mix. There's plenty of surface area available in a heat exchanger for the hot stream to transfer energy to the cold stream. Example exercise. Imagine a process to produce ammonia, then draw the corresponding block flow diagram. The first thing we might consider is whether or not ammonia is found anywhere in nature. Maybe we can extract it from a plant or something. However, ammonia has the chemical formula of NH3, and unfortunately it's not found anywhere in nature, so we have to make it with a chemical reaction. Perhaps the simplest possibility for a chemical reaction is reacting nitrogen and hydrogen gases, which are both diatomics. To borrow a concept from chemistry, we need to balance the chemical reaction, and doing so tells us that we will need three times the amount of hydrogen compared to nitrogen but these are details for later episodes. Without worrying too much about how the reaction occurs, but acknowledging that nitrogen is usually an inert gas that doesn't easily react, we have to deal with the possibility that there will be some unreacted reactants in our product stream. We can get rid of these by sending the whole stream to a separator, and then we will get pure ammonia product in one stream, and a mixture of nitrogen and hydrogen in another stream. Of course, none of this is as easy as I'm making it sound right now, but again, these are details that we'll get to later on. 
Next, being environmentally conscious and economically savvy chemical engineers, let's decide what to do with that stream of nitrogen and hydrogen from the separator. Hydrogen is quite flammable, so we shouldn't release it to the atmosphere. But even if it wasn't, throwing away reactant molecules is wasteful. They're still perfectly good. So we can put a mixer before the reactor and we can recycle the unreacted reactants. Now we don't have to feed as much fresh reactants to achieve the same feed to the reactor. Finally, let's consider where we get our feed molecules from. We could buy pure nitrogen from a company, but this might be expensive. Alternatively, there is an abundant and cheap source of nitrogen all around us. Air contains about 79 mole percent nitrogen. If we use air for our nitrogen source, we have two options. We could simply feed raw air, but then the other 21% is oxygen, and that might affect what goes on in the chemical reactor. The other option is to feed air to another separation process. The pure nitrogen from this process will be the feed to the reactor, while we can safely return the oxygen to the atmosphere. Or, hopefully, we could find another use for this oxygen. We could also consider how we could make hydrogen instead of buying it, but I'll leave that as an exercise for you to think about. If you're stuck, try looking up the Haber-Bosch process to see how it's done in real chemical engineering industry. Wrapping up this episode, let's review the learning objectives. Now that this video is over, you should be able to do the following. 1. Explain the concept of a block flow diagram and explain why it is useful and essential to chemical engineers. 2. Name several examples of common chemical engineering process units. 3. Imagine the key components of a possible block flow diagram to produce a given product. And that will conclude this episode. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.